In this four-part docuseries, we're going to cover topics that will shed light on all things needed to help us navigate into the new earth. We will learn how to stop annoying repetitive karmic cycles, clear past traumas, and rise above once and for all. We will learn how to live in harmony and finally say farewell to discord. We will learn how to become master manifestors by attracting loving relationships, compassion, abundance, and truth. We will also shed light on how to learn from love instead of the old earth way of pain and suffering. And likewise, we will learn how to attract love and kindness to us. We will learn how to connect and communicate to the divine truth ourselves. These and many more subjects are to come. So settle in, get comfortable, because we have a lot of ground to cover and very much to discuss. So tell me, what happened? On March 20th, I got the call that no parent expects to get. I had a call that Dakota was not breathing. He was 19 years old. My best friend. My mama's boy. Someone I talk to every day. The light of my world. And he had been living on his own for four months. So we had just barely started to learn to be separate physically. And I got there and I was met by an officer at the bottom of the stairs. He lived in an upstairs apartment and she stopped me and she said, he's gone. And it was at that moment that I knew two things. I knew that his body would be without vitality and that I refused that Dakota was gone from me. And so I walked up those steps and there's a bunch of officers in the room and there laid my son. And I saw a baby, a young boy and a man all laid out as one. And I went up to him and I knelt beside his body I went to my knees and I put my hands on his heart and I was overwhelmed with gratitude. I felt so thankful for him and I felt it. Everything that he ever was to me, I was thankful. And it was at that time that I started to speak. I started talking to him. And I told him how much I loved him. And I started to say, okay, okay. I kept repeating, okay. And I told him that I would accept this and that I would walk with strength and that I loved him and that I would follow him. And when I was saying this is when I noticed that every person in the room had taken a knee as I was speaking to Dakota because those words were resonating within them. They had told me later that they had never seen a reaction of someone who was thankful for the person, but that normally it was, this person was taken from me. But I love Dakota so much that I just didn't see anything else other than no separation. No separation kept being what my heart was beating and saying. And I just trusted, I said, I'm. I'm never leaving. I'm going to understand this. And that became my transcendence journey.
Surprisingly, that interview was three and a half months after Julie's son, Dakota, transitioned at the tender age of 19. In uh, early January 2016, my son was home from college and uh, got together with a bunch of his pals, celebrated the last week of Christmas vacation before they all went back to school. They, uh, they gathered up uh, at a house uh, in a lake in Wisconsin, Lake Beulah, um, for, their, for their last night, you know, kick up their heels a little bit, and uh, went, to, uh, went out in uh, you know, a local pub drinking and, and, uh, and carousing and having a little fun. Went back to the, the house, the beach house. There were 12 of them, uh, all friends from the Nutria uh, school uh, in their youth. And, uh, Got together and, and at one point in the evening, about three o'clock in the morning, Christopher and a couple of friends walked by a unlocked boathouse and saw a canoe and it seemed like a good idea at the time to, for th four boys to jump in a three-man canoe with no, uh, with no life vests or, or preservers and uh, paddle out on a partially frozen lake. Um, Middle of the night. 3 a.m. Yeah. Uh, it was a perfect storm for, uh, you know, cold, cold weather, uh, layered clothing, um, under uh, you know, a snoot full of alcohol and uh, and in a you know, frozen, partially frozen lake. So uh, paddled out and uh, none of them came back. Uh, I got a call the next day. I was preparing to watch a football game, expecting Chris to walk in the door any moment. That from one of the boys who whose parents owned the beach house and said that Chris and three friends were missing. I grabbed the dog, jumped in the the jeep and started driving up. And I got a phone call that said it was. Uh, no longer a uh, search, but a recovery that all four had drowned. And that started me on my search to, uh, to find what happens next. Joe is not alone. More and more parents are coming forward experiencing this very thing of their children transitioning. Is it a coincidence? Or are we seeing what many in the spiritual community are referring to the shift of the mass exodus? Morgan and a group of university students traveled to the base camp of Mount Everest in Tibet. He was on an exchange program with a bunch of other students and when he got to the base camp, um, unfortunately, he was feeling completely sick. All of the other kids already had started feeling sick. People were throwing up on the way up the mountain because of the altitude sickness. And when he got there, he took a NyQuil, which was the only kind of medic medicine that he had because he had a terrible headache, and he went to bed. During the night, the other kids saw him wandering around the yurt, which was a huge tent that was at the base camp of Mount Everest. And he was calling everybody by the wrong name, which is another sign of altitude sickness. But um, unfortunately, because they were also under the influence of this altitude sickness, they weren't able to realize that there was a problem with Morgan. And at nine o'clock the next morning, um, Morgan was foaming at the mouth. They couldn't wake him up. And um, they called one of the moms, who's a doctor, who's the mother of one of the kids who was on the program to see what they should do. And she said, get him down the mountain as quickly as possible. So the 13 kids who were there loaded him onto the bus and started down the mountain. By that time, I had gotten the phone number for his roommate, which was good. I knew that he was in distress, but by the time that I was able to call Morgan or to call his roommate, um, they had unloaded him from the bus because he had stopped breathing and they were attempting CPR on Morgan. It was very difficult for these kids because they didn't even really know how to do CPR, but Colin told me when I reached him on the phone um, that it didn't look good, that they were attempting CPR, but he didn't think Morgan would make it. Didn't expect to hear his voice, but I really needed to have him hear my voice. And so 
I asked Colin to put the phone up to his ear and I told him that I loved him, that we were proud of him and not to be afraid. He then passed on this desolate tract of the Tibetan countryside. So I understand that you weren't able to see Chris at the scene? Yeah, it was a, it was tough. Uh, I, I got to be honest with you, I, I think I was a little bit in shock at that point. Once I got the call that said that Chris wasn't on this earth anymore, and uh, I went up there in, in this big, you know, very nice lake house with uh, a picture window overlooking Lake Beulah and boats and emergency boats and sirens uh, and, and, and lights flashing, a bunch of kids in one corner crying, uh, parents in the other corner crying. And Christopher was one of the first, uh, was the first uh, body to be recovered. And I wanted to see my boy and uh, Wisconsin law didn't allow it. Um, they pulled him out and then taken pictures. Uh, and I was had to go downstairs with the medical examiner and, and, and identify him from the picture. Celtic cross, Buffalo Bison's baseball uh, jacket. It was him, but it wasn't him. Uh, also, I had to wait a, a day or two before Wisconsin would release his body back to Illinois uh, to go to the funeral parlor. And were you able to sit with Chris then? Well, the night of the uh, of the wake, it was a cold January night in, in, in Chicago suburbs, and it was nasty and raining and wet. And there were 2,000 people waiting in line wow. to see my boy, uh, friends, family school friends, neighborhood friends, lined up around the block. And uh, uh, the, the funeral parlor, Grace Martinson, so a lovely funeral director, left it open for two additional hours so that everybody could pay their respects to them, us, and Chris. And, uh, and so we did that. And, and one of the tough parts, because I, I really didn't remember this till a little bit later, like a couple of years later, that I remember uh, I was left alone sitting in front of, sitting on a love seat in front of the casket. And I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave my boy. <clears throat> to be alone in this cold room. Um, said, let me stay as long as I wanted. And then, uh, and then we buried him the next day at Sacred Heart Cemetery. Would you say that you were a spiritual person prior to this event? Not overly. I think I believed in, in a higher power. I believed in a God, but I don't know if it was part of my day to day. So I would say that I had been mildly exposed to the spiritual aspect, but no more than that. So prior to this event, what was your view on death? What happens to... I thought it was kind of like retirement. You know, you, you, you went somewhere. Your soul, I believe in the soul. Your soul went somewhere. And you, you, you kind of chilled out eternity, maybe. Maybe it was like Naples, Florida for souls, you know. Um, but I didn't take it any farther. And I certainly didn't take it any farther about the, our involvement or accessibility to souls on the other side. Let's move forward to present. Is meditation important to you? Do you do meditation now? I do. And I, I tell you, I never did it prior to January 3rd, 2016. Um, I started right after. And you have, it's a learned trait. You, yeah, you have yeah. to work on it to learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. And so meditation is a, is a monster key. I'll tell people that tell me, well, you know, I try meditation, I'm not good at it. And I'll say try harder, right? The payoff's worth it. You need to be able to meditate yeah. to connect with somebody. You need to raise your level of consciousness and they need to lower their energy level and we can meet in the middle. But you got to do your part. You can't sit back and wait for spirit to, to approach you all the time. You know, you mentioned to me earlier about that word gratitude. Yeah. Tell me about that. You know, I'm a huge fan of gratitude. You know, I, I, and more and more I believe in, in a higher power, God, Yahweh, whatever you want to call him. It's, it's the source, mm -hmm. right? And I was fortunate. I had a loving father. Flawed, you know, but amazingly loving. He would never do anything to hurt me. So I was able to take that concept and, and bring it forward to a, a heavenly father. So when... When I'm given a gift like connecting with my son, 
Yeah. I think you've got to show gratitude back to the universe. I mean, as a father myself, I love it when my kids are grateful. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll tell you a story that when, when Christopher drowned, you know, I was kind of like a walking zombie trying to figure all this stuff out. I had a family to take care of. I had all kinds of details, funerals, masses, receptions. And every night I'd hit the knees before I hit the bed. And I would say, God, thank you, God, for my sobriety. Thank you, God, for my family. But you and I aren't good. You took my kid. And, uh, and I'd go to sleep because I was exhausted. And on the third night, I went through my routine of trying to straighten God out. And uh, I got a message. I mean, holy cow, talk about grateful. I get a message from the source. Right? <laughs> you know, if you didn't think I'd off the reservation before, now you might think it now, but before. But I got a message back that I didn't take your kid. Why on earth do we experience things like this? Is there perhaps a purpose? Is there something that we should learn from it? Is it something that we can rise above from? Is it possible? to rise above these types of adversities. So when you were kneeling in front of Dakota, what emotions was going through your, through you, what, what were you feeling? I kept my heart open and I was flooded with emotions of gratitude and unconditional love. I had no victimhood and I, I knew this event was not about me. I got out of the way. So shortly thereafter, you, you being a Reiki master, you went to a Reiki master. Did you want to know why this happened? Why am I experiencing this? What, what was going on with that? I think it was, was it, was, was it in a, within a couple of days? Yes. Within a couple of days of Dakota's transition, I did contact my Reiki master because I wanted to know in whose chart the event had happened. And I wanted to start understanding the purpose. I had a deep longing to know the bigger picture of this tragic event. And I was allowing from the beginning to follow that, follow the why this happened. And what is it that I need to learn and allow this experience to show me? And I knew that on day three. Now, most parents would want to be reassured that the child is okay. Where were you shortly thereafter? Did you instinctively know he was okay? I mean, like, where were you, Julie? I did know he was okay. There was not a moment in Dakota's waking life that I didn't speak to him. And... Being able to be present when the body was no longer vital, I could feel him. My heart was open and it was in that openness that I already knew his consciousness still existed. I just reached out to my Reiki master in order to understand the events that allowed this exit point to show up and that started the transcendence journey which then led to a portal being open to where Dakota and I still have connection. A portal. A portal. A portal of energy that happens through the heart. You told me that you went back to work rather quickly. How did you prepare yourself to go back to a job and people and people asking what happened and all that? How did you even go back to work so quickly? You know, it was one foot in front of the other. It wasn't getting ahead of what I was feeling. It wasn't judging any of the emotions that were coming up, but always coming back to my now moment. I just keep reaffirming the now and also trusting the love. Unconditional love is without form. And that was the one beacon that I, could, that I kept aligning up to. Even when the pain was crushing, I never wavered from trusting how much love was built between Dakota and I while we were here together. That's what I followed. And it took one step in front of the other, but I I continued to do what I needed to do because this isn't about me. I'm still living here. 
This was about me supporting Dakota's evolutionary process. Our time here is short and we are not in control of other people's exit points, but loving them unconditionally and understanding that we can be a part of their afterlife while we're still here in this life, that's huge. That's what I wanted. That's how I learned to follow it each day that I went to work. You referenced creating a white page. What's, what was that all, all about? When the tragic event of Dakota's transition happened, everything I thought I once knew went out the door. Everything. I questioned everything. And it was in that questioning that I realized the gift is I'm a blank sheet of paper. What that is, is the ability to allow only the things that I know to be true to be able to come within my knowing space. And if you start at that point of doubting everything, that's how you find truth. That's how you know what you resonate with. So the things that only made it on the white paper are things that aligned up with my deep, my deepest knowing. And then I, that's how I started to restructure what my life looks like with Dakota transitioned to another realm. For centuries, adversities have been the best teachers of the earth experience. It is of my opinion that the loss of a child is one of the most difficult adversities a person could ever go through. Now, thankfully, these parents continue to step forward to help shed light on how they are working through this experience. So let's break this down as best we can in order to better understand how they are working through and shifting through this rather difficult event. So I understand prior to these events that you were quite spiritual. Can you tell me a little bit about your spirituality? While I was in India, I spent a lot of time studying transcendental meditation as well as yoga. I was in junior high, high school, and college. So those were really transformative years for me in terms of my own belief system. I never needed the skills of a medium or a psychic uh, for many, many years after, but it was something that allowed me to know that it was always there and available for me. You spoke about kindness, and you made it clear to me that you're not afraid of death. Can you tell me a little bit about what's that about? I think that once you've had a child transition, it's very, very easy to start to feel as though you're part of this world, but also part of the other side. When Morgan transitioned, I realized that this journey here that, we're, that we are um, accomplishing here on Earth is all about love. That's all that matters while we're here. And being able to be kind to others and do as much as we can for others after having a child pass, the only thing that can truly heal us is to be able to heal others, to be able to help as many people as possible. And that's something that I've discovered has not only helped me, but so many of the members of Helping Parents Heal as well. You stress the importance of meditation. Do you think that that contributed into helping you get through this? I definitely do. As a matter of fact, I had been doing transcendental meditation as well as yoga um, from a very young age when I lived in India. Back in the day, I had a guru who designated my mantra that I was supposed to be using to be able to still the monkey mind. That's basically what we all want to do when we're meditating is to be able to not think about all of those um, monkey brain thoughts that are coming into your mind. And so I had this mantra and I remember that I was so religious about meditating that I would even do it in 
the airplane going back from India to the States and I'd be humming my mantra beside the person next to me. And I'm sure that they thought that I was a little bit strange, but it was, it was religious to me. I felt like it was something that I had to do to be able to find inner peace. I didn't know why, because I was only at that time, I was probably 19 years old. What kind of issues do you have at 19 years old that need uh, meditation? But it was a great way for me to start, plus the yoga that I was doing every day as well. These three parents all set out on a journey of a new and different life. It became clear to me that they made brave choices to do their inner work. They shifted their perspective by allowing, combined with trust, to gain enlightenment from this tragic event. So tell me about how that simple act of listening really has helped you. The act of listening internally has helped me because it allows me to hear the one source pointed connection to all of my actions. and. Sometimes we think we always have to do, we have to respond. But when we actually listen, it's going within. And that's where the knowing comes from. So listening is extremely important right now because it comes from within and, and, it, and it, it's our guidance system. Give me a little snapshot. Your, how do you work with your clients? You know, I listen back to listening. You know, I, I, their higher self starts coming through. So I intuitively am able to just pick up the, uh, to what they're saying. And then I don't judge, I just hold space. And I all I do is mirror back to them what it is that they're coming through for. And then by holding my light frequency in the presence of them, their soul is able to come forward. And then we're able to unite our lights together and, and allowing them to activate into ascent. And that's the great thing about harmony Harmony resonance is that we, we're able to do that for others in time of need. I kind of sense that you're able to read their, their story. Is that what you said? Yeah, you do. You, you meet the energy first. So when you, start, when you start reading the energies and you start tapping into that part of our beingness, the first thing you do is you're hit with their energy, their aura. So you don't even have to ask a question on a form anymore. You just intuitively read the energy as they come into your presence. And then you're able to meet them there with where you are. And if your channel's cleaned out and you're able to hold a frequency of light and unconditional love, it's easier for them to feel safe and to shift and to surrender. Because it, the, all they need to do is surrender. And then they start to remember their perfect alignment. And they start to trust that I can trust this tragic event. I can lean into a different perspective than what I came here before working with me, that they weren't able to see themselves. You know, I just help them remember and to shine a light on the love, the love that's within the event, the connection, the purpose within the event, because then you can transcend through it. You can walk through it. And so I, I just, I do my best to just be there. I don't really do any of it except just be there. And then the resonance, it makes it easier because we feel, we feel others can understand where we are right then when we need it the most. So it sounds like you're a conduit. Mm hmm Just a frequency of energy. And our cells respond to that. We can activate that in others when we shine our light really bright and when we hold space for them. It makes it easy for the cells of their being to respond to it. That's why it feels good. That's why when you leave a practitioner who is able to do that, you feel enlightened. You feel, you feel higher. You feel a different state of being, you know, you're in your higher self-consciousness again. And you remember. It, yeah. And then it's just anchoring that in to always be in the now, that high state of frequency to always be the now moment. I wanted to learn more about Elizabeth's experience of Eastern philosophy and how it prepared her for this life-changing event. So it sounds to me like this meditation prepared you to have a higher perspective of some of the things that were about to happen in your life. I think that I, I 
<clears throat> was supposed to be doing this meditation so that I could actually heal more quickly from a lot of different events that happened uh, soon after. So you're right. I'm sure that meditation was brought into my life for a very important reason. You know, we talk about adversity and uh, it sounds like you had a very, very different approach to one's life adversities. What was your approach to adversity? Well, first of all, I want to say that I learned about adversity maybe a little bit earlier than a lot of other kids here in the States um, or in Western countries learn about it by living in India. And that is not to say that it's not one of the most beautiful countries in the world, which it is. Um, it is the sights and sounds and smells are just incredible. But you can be walking down the street and see someone who's just recently died. And it's devastating, but at the same time, the reaction in India, because of these Eastern religions that we spoke of, is so different from the way that we treat death in Western religions. It's amazing to me to go to a funeral and see everyone dressed in white because they know where this, this loved one is going. White for them symbolizes love and purity and ascension. And those are things that um, when we're dressed in black, it's just not the same kind of thing, obviously. And even the fact that... Yeah, so you're saying it's a little more on the happier side than well, sad? And actually people associate white with happiness as well. Um, it's, it's more that inner knowledge that you're able to um, acquire in this lifetime that's being represented through that white. Um, seeing these funeral pyres, seeing these ashes moving up towards the heavens and the beautiful white that everyone was dressed in. It was, it was just a, an amazing thing. Seeing the desperate poverty as well that existed in India, in spite of the fact that you could see the most luxurious palaces in India and there are some of the most beautiful places to visit, the beaches and the, and the forests and the temples, there is desperate poverty as well, or at least when I was there. And so being able to see these people who always had smiles on their face, even though they might not know where their next meal is coming from, they, they might not know um, if they have a roof over their head for the evening. Um, they, they still live in joy. And I believe it's because they know where they're going. I think that they know that they're going to a wonderful place, that this is just a starting point, or actually just, um, they're here for a very short time. And then they'll be in an incredibly wonderful place they'll be reincarnating into something even better if they've lived their lives in a good way. And um, I think that's beautiful. So would it be correct to say that hardship, pain, and suffering from your perspective is a great opportunity to learn? Is that what you had said to me? I think that it's a, a fabulous opportunity to learn and I was very fortunate to be able to see this in India and realize that these people were happy, healthy, and whole, in spite of the fact that they were living through very difficult situations with not too much material wealth, really cracked me open and allowed me to see that this life is, is a blip on the camera. It's, a, it's such a small part of our total existence because I know where they are. I know that they're happy and healthy and whole. And the only thing that they want for us is for us to be the same. So tell me about your perspective on, I mean, taking into consideration, you must've learned a lot about this thing called attachment. 
I think that it's important to realize that you cannot be happy if you are too attached to any one situation. Everything's going to change in our lives. Everything shifts. Everything, um, things go south all the time. But if we're able to view these things with compassion and without fear, we soon learn that those situations that we were attached to and that have disappeared are teaching us something new. You know, you had stressed to me the importance of living in the present. That's been your, your mantra all your life. Is that, would you, would you say that? I definitely live in the present. I feel so grateful every day. And I think that part of living in the present is gratitude. When you wake up and you tell yourself, I'm grateful for this day. What can I do with this day? How can I help someone today? Without thinking about what happened yesterday that might not have been a great day, or what's going to happen tomorrow that might be a little stressful because there's something else that's going to happen that you need to worry about, but just focusing on how can I do some, something for someone else today that will make me feel worthy and good about myself. Well, you just touched on the next question, which is the appreciation for gratitude. I think that that was important to you as well, right? Or it still is. Gratitude is one of the most important things that we all need to embrace on this kind of journey. I think that everyone should embrace gratitude, but especially if you have had something happen in your life that is difficult, it's important to look for the silver linings and realize that your life is not as difficult as so many other lives. My dad always says that we are in the 99th percentile here in the United States. That's just the way that it is. Everyone else in the whole world lives in a more difficult and precarious situation. So let's make the best of it while we're here. Let's do as much as we can for others while we're here as well. You know, a lot of the spiritual community said this, we've got to be careful about this phrase of saying, um, why did this happen to me instead of, why is this happening for me? Did you ever have that kind of approach? Yes, because I truly believe that if we have things that are happening to us, supposedly, until we realize that they're happening for us, they're going to keep happening. So... Ah, the karmic... Well, yes, the, anything, you know, you could go into the hospital one week and get back out and, and then didn't really learn what the purpose of doing that was and then go back into the hospital again the next week and come back out again. But I do think that things keep coming into our lives. People keep coming into our lives as well to teach us lessons until we finally learn them. The lessons that we learn come from people that are the most difficult. They don't come from easy people who are coming into our lives and making our lives easy. They come from people who are difficult to get along with. They come from people who are um, telling you things that you don't really want to hear, but it does allow us to grow spiritually. Some of you may recognize my next guest from Death and Back 3. Susan had left her body and traveled to the afterlife, but then came back with a full remembrance of this amazing experience. So I asked Susan about how this experience relates to this current shift that we are all experiencing at this present time. This, uh... This phrase that people are saying that this happened to me instead of it happened for me. Yes, it is happening for you because you asked for it. In your soul contract, 
And it's part of the victim. The to me thing is victimhood. And I can come to, you know, from a place of understanding because I did feel like a victim. You know, at one point, you know, after my childhood, I felt, oh, why, you know, why would that happen to me? I felt like a victim until I understood the gift of the situation that had I never gone through any of those challenges, you know, and traumas, I would not be who I am today. They were gifts to help me grow, expand, and learn unconditional love. So death is never an accident. It's a free will choice. Always. Because there is no death. <laughs> it doesn't matter how you leave. So is it a soul's choice to experience a catastrophic? Absolutely. 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 Right now, look what we're going through. This is pretty catastrophic. I call I, I say that the whole world is experiencing a dark night of soul because that's what revelation is. Everything's coming up to be revealed and healed. So this is catastrophic. You know, too many people who have lost loved ones during COVID, you know, and all the adversities, however they've left. So it's pretty catastrophic, you know. So we have all chosen this, and especially this, because we wanted to be here at this amazing time, to be here and see it and to be a witness and at our light, hold space for others, you know, that were wobbly, you know, hold at each other's hands and rise above our own darkness. Mm. Heal. When we heal, we heal the world too. I've been told that um, that not only I, but everybody's a creator. Yes. We are all, this is 3D Earth, mm -hmm. all right, is a place of co-creation. Whatever is happening in your life, you did create it. <laughs> so own it. So own it, baby. <laughs> However, if you want something different, you can create that too. And that's the change in why people come to me. Hey, I want something different. I'm ready to, you know, let that baggage go. And we, uh, you and I talked a little bit about um, the laws of attraction. Yeah, the laws of attraction because the uh, experiences, the people who... Um, are attracted to a part of you, let's say, you know, five years ago, that person five years ago, whoever was attracted to that part of me who had issues or things I hadn't overcome, um, those people will leave. When I rise above the challenges that I came here to learn, and then a new, new people will come in who can meet my vibration. Yeah, I know with myself, you know, my father being physically and mentally abusive, and I got into yes. relationships, and maybe not physically, mm -hmm. but, uh, also abusive, and then another one, and I was like, okay. What's going on here? So then I made a clearing, a change, and went through some, did some inner work, and then I'm not attracting that anymore. Right. So you're saying that's the laws of attraction. That is the laws of attraction. You energy. change, everything shifts with you. Now, four years ago, I made the conscious choice to finally let go and trust everything will serve my highest good. I put everything in the hands of the divine. What quickly came to my consciousness was the fact that in order for me to fully embody this was listening. I needed to be able to wholeheartedly listen without allowing my irrational mind to get in the way. It was this divine inner voice that became my life guiding compass. I know I've had my team tell me this countless times, and I didn't really hear it at first. Uh, it was about listening. <laughs> They're like, Craig, <laughs> you need to listen. Yeah, and haven't we all had that? We had that nudge, that knowing, and then it said, turn left, and you're like, well, that's a long way. And then the, the right brain says, no, we have to go this way. It's shorter, and it ends up being longer. And when we haven't listened to that guidance within, um, it has taken us on a detour, let's say. 
That quiet, soft voice within, which every single person has, is what it's imperative to start tuning into and trusting and listening. And it's through feeling it won't make logical sense. Yeah. Because if you're open and willing, mm -hmm. I can support you in showing you you are able. You may not like it. You may not want to, but you are able to take that next step. What it might look like, I tune into the person's soul energy. It's almost like they come and say, oh good, now we have a mouth to work with and we're gonna tell the human this because they haven't been listening. They haven't been paying attention to the nudges we've been giving. And so I like to do it with some humor. Of course. Um, make it fun, but what happens is truth is truth and it stands on its own and so what we do is we excavate the truth from within and pull it out and there's lots of different ways that can look so it sounds to me like you use your empath abilities yeah it's like i can see the timeline yeah. if you will the soul timeline nice and so i it's like they're sh i'm shown what's on top what is in the way Mm -hmm. which actually is the way. So when you can identify, wow, I thought this was in the way and you're telling me this is the way. Wow. Now I've got a path. Now I can move. Yeah. And, and there's no greater, oh, to watch someone blossom into the remembering of who they really are, not who they were told they were or who they thought they were. So would you say that you're a conduit or a vessel of sorts? Yeah. My, I always joke that um, my human mm -hmm. has had to go, move to the back of the bus. <laughs> I, I feed it popcorn and... I love the bus put, metaphor. Like mm -hmm. we're all in school. We're yeah. in a school bus. School bus. Yeah. It just goes to the back of the bus and I have a DVD player. So they... And occasionally my human will come up because it's all soul drive for me right now. And it'll tap me on the shoulder and go, are you sure you know where you're going? Are you sure you're okay? I sure we're gonna be okay. I'm like, oh, thank you for your concern. Yeah, we're good. Oh, okay, just checking. Mine would be interested in who's driving the bus. <laughs> Have you checked his credentials out? I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, would you say that your clients are? Uh, I mean, this is kind of an obvious question, mm -hmm. but um, this stuck repeating the same behaviors over and over. I know I've done it myself. So is that something that you see come up in your sessions? Yeah, I call them loops. They're energy loops. And they're really thought loops. And they made a path in the brain, let's say. We basically take, there's lots of different ways we can play, but we can take and we erase that, that pathway and we put a new, a new path in there, the soul path, the essential path in there. And so what happens is, you know, you can hear, how come this keeps happening to me? Well, nothing's happening to you. It's all for you. In the illusion, we believed we were a victim to everything happening to us. As a soul awakening, we are like, wow, this is for us. So we can see where we got caught in the illusion and we can let it and then you probably help the assist the client to um, work through it. Yeah, so that's an important part of the equation. It's an important we identified part. it. We know what it is. We feel the the, the trigger, the pain, the whatever, mm -hmm. and then walking. Well, yeah, in the body lies the knowing. So that's why it's so so and so important to get present in your body. Most people are not really body aware yet. It is changing, mm -hmm. but a lot of people haven't paid attention to those subtleties that the body is always trying to communicate with us. And that, that's your signal. You become a partnership with your body. And I always say, kiss your body, love your body. It is your divine sacred partner here. It is supporting and housing your beautiful soul essence. And so I imagine you probably emphasize spiritual trust in along with this. It is essential. And the reason why we don't trust is because we've been taught not to. 
course. And then we got the ego coming along. And then ego. Remember, the ego isn't bad. It's not good or bad, right or wrong. It just is. It was part of the game, the human game. And its job was a very important one. And that was to keep us safe. But the program of the ego or the human was, I'm not okay, I won't be okay. And then that would start boiling up and people reacted from that place based on their past experiences. Yeah, it still, it still kind of baffles me that there's a lot of humans that still believe they're, they're victims. But, uh, yes. what's, your, uh, what's your perspective on this? Victimhood. Well, when I went home, um, before I incarnated into the body, there were no blindfolds. <laughs> no blindfolds on my spirit and my soul. I saw exactly what was going on and what, what I, I would encounter, not exactly how it would transpire, but these would things would be encountering because this is the evolutionary time period of Earth and I came to break the chains. So I would have to go through it. I felt like a victim after my childhood. You know, I did feel like that. But all that was doing was telling me, you haven't healed it. Because there are no victims. We all chose to be here. It was our choice to come and to use this amazing time period to rid ourselves of anything that we've held on to from other lifetimes and clear, clear the slate. Well, then what is, what is this victim consciousness? Victim consciousness is, um, this happened to me, poor me, complaining, never doing anything about it, just telling everybody your woes. Um, you know, you stay stuck. I had heard that, uh, you know, staying in that victim consciousness or that drama tends to release some kind of chemical that becomes addictive. Uh, well, I'm going to tell you what you're doing is you're brainwashing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it seems like it's, there's, there's people that just are addicted to drama. Oh, yeah. Now, we all <laughs> see that. Okay. But can we pull it? Can we pull them out of it? We can't. Because they have to shift their perspective and see that it's not working for them. They are their own worst enemy. I know, I've had someone come to me who said that um, it was really interesting and she came with an open heart and she said, you know, I want to feel these things, you know, but I, I was told that I have a mental illness and all my thoughts are negative. And I said, listen, it's up to you to change that. And if you're only visiting one person who's labeling you and you're accepting that as a label to, you know, then you're brainwashing yourself because you're here to rise above it. That's your soul challenge. That was your contract. That's the biggest thing you came to rise above was to take hold of this and turn your pain into your power mm. and overcome and achieve it. And guess what? Check that box and graduate. Next up, Julie and I discuss the ability to change the energy of a room through the power of our actions. So the officers dropped to their knees as well when you were making that pledge. They did. I turned around and every single person in the room, by listening to my words, were on their knees and they were part of it. And it, it goes back to what we were talking about. Words, our words matter. They felt my words because I was, my soul was speaking to Dakota's soul at that moment. I was out of body. I was out of ego. It was, I was speaking from my soul. What do you mean, out of your body? What do you mean? I was in spirit. I was in spirit with my son. I had a body. Were you like in a trance? Were you in shock? Yeah, I was, I was in my higher self frequency. I had a body, but I wasn't aware of my body at that moment. I was speaking from my soul in its totality. You had mentioned something about a, an instant life review. Instant life review. 
I, everything I experienced with my interactions with Dakota on earth, I was reviewing in those, in these moments of grief. I'm doing my life review as I'm allowing them to be experienced and not letting them anchor in or stay stuck in them. I'm releasing all the memories and the emotions around that shared karmic action with another soul. So there's still no separation with you and him? Absolutely none. And I find it really interesting that you were born in this spiritually renowned location as Sedona. You were born and raised. I was born in Sedona and a nurse for 20 years, became a Reiki master two years before Dakota transitioned. Five years I was doing my inner work. I had started meditation, going within, quieting my mind, clearing out my own karmic cobwebs per se with relationships and timelines that I could remember. I had been doing all of that prior to this day. You said that your meditation was extremely crucial. Your prior, all that work, all that meditation that you were doing prior to this transition really helped a lot. It does because if you don't do that inner work, when the tragic life event happens, you have to do it anyways. And all that work that I had done was pulling out everything I was going to need to understand my purpose and to allow this event to be without judgment, to allow Dakota's life and exit to be all that it was designed to be. You know, you talked about having two perspectives, this higher perspective mm -hmm. and then this human mm -hmm. uh, perspective. Can you shed some light on this? idea that this concept that you have the the two perspectives is i'm julie having a visceral response to loss the body goes through a traumatic event it's going to respond i i couldn't eat I, it became unimportant but the higher perspective was from the very beginning i felt like i had guidance and understanding and a surrender to it and that comes from a higher state of awareness, is being able to surrender into the event. And it was there from the very moment that I showed up at the steps of that apartment. And I was aware of it. I was aware of that higher self perspective walking me through it and being there as it was happening, realizing that the body and this human existence point of view was going to feel all the pain was going to have to shift and change everything I knew about who I was before that point. It's that part was unavoidable also. You seem to have an accelerated grief process. Like, did you even go through grief? I'm experiencing grief in a new ascended way. There's work that's out there about the grief process and it laid the framework, but the way that I'm experiencing it is part of the fifth dimensional shift. It's believing and trusting in the higher purpose of it all. It's allowing there to still be goodness in what seems to be perceived as a dark event, a tragedy or a victim stance to this happened to me. It's just allowing love to be greater than the pain. And so by trusting that and developing that, I'm hoping that I can keep working with people that go through this and shed light that there is a way to transcend it. You transcend it, which is rising above the tragic event itself. And by doing that, you gain wisdom you align with the purpose of why I came here, why Dakota had a life experience to even begin with. It's allowing that to be magnificent. You mentioned a crucial time. I think you had said that you leveraged this six months after he, he transitioned. You, you said that it seemed really like 
You capitalized on it in some way. What, what are we talking about this six months following? I call it six months raw because the one thing that happens in such an event as a child transitioning is every cell in your body is open. Every cell is open. And what that allows you is this plane of divine grace to show up. And you really can harness some deep knowings and deep awakenings. And it's during that six month time frame that you can work with the energies and the light beings and the soul that's on the other side. You can really gain ground and understanding during that time. Um, it's in the pain. It's in the experience of it. It's just bringing awareness to how deep that pain can be. It's being aware inside that pain that those six months can lay a, f a, a framework of really transcending grief. Like any parent, I would assume that you wanted desperately to speak to Dakota. Mm -hmm. I did. And in that desire to have contact with him, it, it does come. It does come. There are signs from the other side. They're in the subtlety and it's in the reassurance of following your heart through that portal of connection. That's where it is. And he and I have a continued connection that hasn't been broke from the beginning. You being from the medical profession, you're well aware of all these street drugs and all that. I would have, I mean, me, I probably would have gotten really angry having had to come to terms with these, you know, these drugs. Did you become angry? I never experienced anger. I actually had no judgment about Dakota's free will choice in regards to uh, taking a drug that caused the event to happen. And it comes back to, I didn't judge him for it. And by not judging him. But someone gave him this. Someone did give it to him. And does that necessarily mean that it changes the event? It, it didn't. He still transitioned. So for me, I was more interested in allowing him to be in his wholeness. I was more interested in Dakota. The higher good. The higher good and where Dakota was in his soul is more was, was more important than what's happening here because that will take care of itself. Karma will deal with that. Yeah. I have faith that this planet and outcomes of choices will be had. My energy can be focused more on Dakota, which was the light of my life versus the person who gave him something that will be handled. I know it will be. Forgive me if I'm speaking out of context, but it just seems like all this inner work that you had done prior to Dakota transitioning and becoming a Reiki master prior to this, you've been exercising a lot of meditation. You were, you were walking the walk. So I feel it's directly relatable to how you healed so quickly. And with all that that I was able to do or was doing prior to this event is the reason that I am able and want to help humanity. Now that's so much outside of myself that I want others to realize that there's another way to experience these transitions of life and death. Because of all that other work, I'm able to be of service to others, to help them understand there's another way to experience this. So what do you think would have happened if you would have never have done all that inner work, becoming a Reiki master, getting into all that meditation? What do you think would have happened if you had not done all that with the transitioning of your son? I would have to do all that and process the transition. I would have to get to work on all that that would be showing up right now. All of that lack of knowing how to navigate emotions or how to deal with something so severe. I would have to do that also. And just living the experience of a transitioned soul 
is hard enough, much less to bring me into it and all my inner work that I had been avoiding. I am so grateful that I have a connection within myself, that I'm able to understand what Dakota's soul can be allowed in this. It's really unselfish to allow this to be. I'm not trying to read too much into it, but just allowing it to be. So you never really experienced any depression? Sadness, yes. Missing him, a lot. But depression, no. To me, I think depression is an emotion like sadness that's holding me down and being depressed by sadness at such an extreme amount. When sadness shows up, I release it. That's what tears are for. That's the, the, the physical sign of release. And I allow the emotion to be felt. And then I, I, I remember and open up that heart portal. But if I were to just allow sadness to weigh on me in a large amount, then it just depresses the soul. It depresses it down. It fills up our light source. And by keeping that open and cleared out, then the sadness dissipates. And then the love comes back. The joy memories come back. A different experience with his brother who's still here can be allowed. So I just sit with sadness when it comes up, but I don't let it depress me. I mean, like, did friends and family, did, did others try to convince you that somehow you were a victim? Did you ever? Absolutely. I had a coworker tell me that she felt uncomfortable around me because I was not home and on medication and not getting out of bed for a year. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's really quite remarkable. I mean, your son just transitioned and here you are smiling with me. Being able to smile is just allowing myself to experience the love that I have for him. And I, I know that I'm going to be with him again. The, the bonds that we have with some souls are lifetimes in the making and it's unbreakable. It doesn't end here. We start towards death the moment that we're conceived. And so to think that death is just an ending to all that is, is not true. So the smile comes from a place of trusting, an inner trust that Dakota is okay and that he is a guiding light and that he's back at his wholeness. And I love him enough to allow that to be why I can sometimes smile. You know, I would assume that some people might say, ah, she doesn't love her kid because she seems happy and experiencing joy and everything. What, what, what do you say to those? I say it's because I love Dakota so much that I understand that unconditional love and honoring him in his fullness is the most important thing to me. You seem to have a, a different perspective of time. Help me understand your perception. Time does not really exist for me. It's kind of just moments of awareness. Living in the now. Living in the now and bringing consciousness back to the one-pointedness of where I am when I'm experiencing what's being played out. Joe talks about him being in a new reality and the importance of acceptance. What about um, acceptance versus resistance? You know, there's a, there's a, there's a saying that says, uh, let go and let God. My buddy Eric, who's an attorney and a beautiful uh, guitarist and who, was a, who stepped up for Chris a few times when he needed some legal representation, said, let go and let God. He said, let go and be dragged. You know, you better accept it because it's happened. Mm. You know, what are you going to do? It's, it's, it's your now. It's your reality. So, so, 
So strap, you know, strap, strap on the backpack and start walking because that's really what is your reality now. You know, whether you accept it or not, it still is a reality. Well, speaking of reality, now you have a new reality. Your life is different. Yeah, and and you know, if this was like uh, door number one or door number two, if I could choose, but it's not. My life is totally different. I don't get to play catch with Chris or take a new ball game, but I have an awareness of, of my spiritual self that I really didn't before and where I'm going. And I know at the end of the day, I'm gonna share that with him. So, so bad start, good deal, you know? Um, I, I'm really grateful that I don't have to go through life thinking my son is just missing. Or, or, or gone, because he's not. So you strike me as a guy that probably had a pretty feisty ego. Yeah. Where are you at now? I try to keep it under wraps. You know, I'm still one of my favorite guys. <laughs> um, I think God and I are in pretty good shape, you know. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I'm comfortable in my, in my, in my skin. Mm -hmm. You know, I like who I've become. Um, events do that. You know, there was a great line from the book and the movie, The Shack, that yeah. God said that I can make amazing good out of horrible tragedy. That doesn't mean I caused the tragedy. And I believe that. I think this is the books, the interviews, the touching parents, is amazing good out of this, out of this tragedy that I was handed. There are so many ways to communicate with spirit. None is better than the other. The importance here is leveraging whatever means necessary to bridge this communicative gap. Now with Joe, he began communicating with Christopher, actually using a very old technique. Run this by, run this by me. So you, you just were woken up at three o'clock in the morning one night and was summons to go into the- Yeah, the first time was January 3rd, 2017, three mm -hmm. o'clock in the morning. Still happens to this day. It happens two, three times a month. I'll just, it's amazing. I'll just sit up and I'll look over at the, the phone or, or, and say it's, it's, you know, it's 2.58 or three o'clock and, and I go, hey buddy, you know, all right. You know, and, and every, sometimes I can't answer the bell. I'm tired, I gotta be honest with you. And, and he's let me off the hook because he said, dad, time is yours, not mine. You want to do it tomorrow? I'm here. But I, I get up and I run through that routine. It's usually the whole thing starts, it takes about an hour um, from start to finish. And uh, to this day, I look forward to that happening. And I, and I take it all, write it all down in longhand. That's the, uh, the, that's the channel writing. You know, he's given me, this isn't, people say, why don't you ask some questions? I said, because this session, with mediums, you can ask questions. This session's all dictation. He oh, brings wow. up stories that I completely, I hadn't even thought of, that I'd forgotten. Stories about when he was a kid. So that's when I know it's not me coming up with this to try to put a salve under the, the broken heart, over the broken heart, that I know it's him. He'll bring up things that I completely forgot about. He brought up something called, about the green flash, which is when the, the, the sun goes down and hits the, hits the horizon at the right time, and sometimes there's this green flash has been written about for you know hundreds of years. And we would try to watch it and never got to one. And then he wrote about it and a couple of days later on Siesta Key, on Lido Key, I saw the first green flash. You know, it's like, holy cow, thanks buddy. So during this time of waking up at 3 a.m., you got your piece of paper out, candle, maybe some sage. Not maybe, those are the deal. <laughs> it's gotta be the same, the same legal pad. Staples stopped making the, the legal pad that uh -oh. I had for a long time. I found a pretty good substitute, and he's okay. Plus, I just found a, a ream of, of staples that are left. I was like, Phew. I use the same velocity, big velocity pen. My buddy, who's a, Andrew Anderson, who was the first medium I saw in person after he drowned, um, handed me one of these pens in a spirit circle. So I bought a hundred of them. You know, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to run out streak. of these. I'm not going to run out of the blow of this streak, right? So it's sage, it's candles. It's, 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 it's uh, it, you know, it, 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 pictures, um, it's, it, it's crystals. I do everything. And, and, you know, if they said, 
drum sounds. You know, I'd put on drum sounds. I'm, I'm going to do everything I can to clear the airwaves so I can connect well with this kid. It's kind of like, remember when cell phones first came out and you couldn't get a you know, you'd signal and you'd go to somebody's balcony or you'd climb up on a, uh, a mountain to get a good cell phone? That's what this is. You know, it's connecting. Mm-hmm. So you want to clear the air so you get a good signal. And he hasn't let me down yet. I had heard um, from Christopher, Dad let go of that. What is, what is that all about? Dad let go of that? I'm assuming just a doubt. You know, that, I'll tell you exactly what it is. And I was just thinking that. I don't know what that meant. That meant that I, when, I, when I was starting, when I would have these messages, it would be like, wow, is this really him? And then I let go of that. They should be you know, smooth. They should be like a canoe cutting through water. Now, my son died in a canoe. Do you think I'd ever use that as an analogy? Never. So I think I was able to let go of the doubt by what he's shown me. And I did. I let go. I was worried that after the first book, these visits would stop. And he told me, after, after the first, don't worry, Pop. We're not done yet. You know. Book number two. Book number two is coming out. And uh, I've already started three. So I oh guess, my gosh. I guess we're going to do this, him and I, until... Until it's time for me to to take the big parachute drop. Okay, so for the men out there, what advice do you have for them going through something as you did? Let go of the BS, man. I mean, cry. Cry with your spouse. Take long walks. Do what you got to do. You know, ma- you know, manhood isn't about sucking it up, you know. Manhood is about being an example. I wanted my kids to know... You know, I function, I'm good at what I do, I'm, but I want them to know that I feel and I hurt. Now, you know, I, I don't break down in front of them, but they know I have emotions and they know what I'm doing, what, what, you know, in these three o'clock sessions. You know, it's an example to them of what, you know, kind of an evolving man is looking like. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a work in progress, man, that's for sure. You know, they ask... You know, the, the, the one time they talked about the statue of David, they asked Michelangelo about the statue of David. How did they carve that out of one block of granite or one block of uh, stone? And he said, you know, David was always in there. Mm-hmm. I just had to chisel around to let him out. And that's what I think God's doing with me. You know, um, chisel around. So, you know, if you're if you're a guy and thinking you got to be a tough guy, you know, you got to be a loving guy. You know, you got to be a loving guy. And being a loving guy doesn't mean you ain't a guy's guy, you know? So would you say that, I mean, it sounds pretty obvious to me that men process loss differently. Yeah. What would you... Uh... Well, I think they do. I think society tells us we have rules, you know? Yeah. Women can do this way and get together in groups and share, but guys are supposed to be like, uh, you, know, the, you know, the Lone Ranger, you know, and, and, and handling it. And that's... That's just society. That's not the way life's supposed to be. You know, we're communal animals, you know. And, and I found that, you know, I wrote a chapter in the second book called Good Eggs. And it's a, it's a quote from Moneyball. Brad Pitt was in it. And it's about the good eggs in my life. You know, and, and, and good eggs aren't partially there for you. They're there for you. Mm-hmm. You know, and I've been blessed. They have a bunch of good eggs. And all guys, guys, you know. And... Uh, And and tell these guys, just let it down, bro. You know, let it down. As I continue my conversations with Julie and her healing journey, I quickly realize there's much more to learn from her success. So talk to me about judgment. Judgment comes back to that one pointed, you should believe what I believe. And if you don't, I'm going to think that you're less than me. If we could stop judging others and empower others to be who they are authentically, then it creates freedom. So would you say that all past lifetimes are all coming to a head right now? I do think that because we're aware of all of our past lifetimes with this present lifetime. That's the difference. Because we're remembering them. We are. And I know this is something that you subscribe to deeply, which is turning to the divine. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that. The divine. There's one source creation of all love and all knowing. And when we turn to that divinity and remember 
that there's more to who we really are, that living here is just a fraction, it's an experience to be had, then we can remember that we are divine beings. When we can remember that, then we stand in our divinity and we are timeless. Our soul is going to go back from here, back to wholeness. And we'll look back and we'll have a life review. And how great would it be if we have life reviews of being able to transcend the events and impact others through tragedy? If people could realize that we can actually start to do our life review now, since there is no more past karmic lives, and we're aware of unity consciousness, then we can actually start to see the timeline of doing our life review once we leave planet Earth. So tell me about getting stuck, repeating. Tell me about this that you see happening with your, your work. Uh, one that comes up a lot is shame. They just, they, they feel that they didn't do something to prevent it. And it's just a karmic loop. It's a pattern that's memorized that they just keep coming back to. But when you actually realize the thought that's tied to that emotion, and you allow it to just be released and you can show the light that you don't have to repeat it, then what you do is you actively let that energy go for the soul and for the person on earth that's just repeating the cycle. It's just easier to help them shift out of that pattern, that karmic loop, and being able to stop, bring the awareness back, and choose a different perspective, choose a different emotion. So that phrase you mentioned, I th you said... Uh walking through it or working through it. I think I heard you say that. Yeah, you have to go forward. You have to keep going through the pain. You can't build a wall around out of the pain and box yourself in. You need to, you know, it's easier if you realize that it's something you can go through. It's permeable. You just have to walk through it by allowing it to be there. I'm hearing a lot of chatter in the spiritual community about getting rid of the ego altogether and What's your thoughts on that? Well, I had complete ego death the day that I saw Dakota's body. I mean, ego, there's a, there's a purpose for ego. It's here to protect you. Um, it's the thing that backs up your belief system. So wanting to get rid of the ego just is complete surrender. And when you're completely surrendered, then you can allow more of your higher self to show up. You just, you, it's like taking off the... It's a balancing act. Yeah. I'm saying that's the ego. I respect it. I know what you're saying. But just allowing it not to be the topic of conversation in all that you do. Allow the protection to come down and just be in it. Don't hide from it. Just go in unprotected. Go into the situation wholeheartedly, heart open. And then the ego will bow down and walk behind you. And that's, that's a much better place because you're going to have an awareness that's going to guide you through it. And it's going to be a softer transition. So what happens if we just screw it, bury these traumas? I'm not going to deal with it. What happens if we just bury them? <laughs> They're going to come up. <laughs> There's no hiding it. It's still part of the pre-birth plan. We're gonna to have to clean out the cobwebs of karma. And by doing so, it allows your vessel to hold more light. So why would you wanna bury it? It's gonna be in there. It's gonna create, it's gonna take up space inside you. So you might as well just go ahead and go within and work through it. Otherwise it's just gonna create another same situation scenario next month. It's just gonna continue. It's the law of attraction like we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. So whatever intention and action you put out, you're, gonna, you're going to call more of that. So if you avoid and avoid, you're going to keep calling forth things that are going to be needing to be dealt with. And you're going to wonder why it's you keep get louder, getting this and louder. And louder. And louder. <laughs> So 
So tell me about forgiveness, the importance of forgiveness, Julie. Oh, the importance of forgiveness is you're not entangled to an action that was had or caused to you by another. It's entanglement. Energy is entanglement. So when you forgive an action or an experience, then you are no longer entangled to the one-pointedness of it. Dakota's transition is something that I've really gone into allowing it to not be entangled energy, but something that I can liberate him still in. And if I couldn't forgive even the act showing up in my life of having a son transition, that would invite so much entangled energy to have to work through. It does not mitigate the pain or the visceral human experience of it. It just doesn't entangle me and my light and his soul and my soul into things that don't liberate why, the why behind it, the purpose behind it. You know, you and I talked about healing and then holding. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if that's a word, holding. Mm-hmm. But we kind of just said, maybe somebody could look that up. <laughs> or maybe we just defined it. So talk to me about this thing of there's healing and then there's holding. The difference is in healing, you think you're without something or that you need something. Holding is remembering that you already are all that it is that you're seeking. It goes back to there's no separation. It's aligning with it now, aligning what it is that you think you need now, including a physical ailment, a mental shift, depression. All of it is being able to align and remember that you can be whole or corrected now and then inviting that energy to shift the body, Mm -hmm. shift the mind space into what you're already holding as a thought and intention. That's holding. A word that comes to mind is acceptance with you. And I think right from the get-go, you had that mastered. You just were in that acceptance. Am I? Grief process acceptance is the last step. I think it's the first step. One of the two things that happened on the bottom of the steps when I was told he's gone, I made two higher self awareness points of reference. One, I knew that they meant his body would be without vitality when I saw it. The second was he's not gone. I refused that at that fraction of a moment it was said to me. And by refusing it, allowed me to accept everything I was going to see at the top of those stairs. And I had already made the decision to be with Dakota from a selfless point of view on my healing journey, to be fully present in my own healing journey. When I laid eyes on Dakota's body for the first time without breath in it, I fell to my knees and I put my hands on his heart. And it was at that moment that I started to tell him how thankful I was for him. And I also started to say, okay, I love you unconditionally. I think you had said that you immediately, after the, this transitioning, that you, you felt him right away. I did. I started to have direct feedback from him and signs and and in subtleties, subtle condolences would happen in those moments, those early moments, still those moments of missing him. It would be consoled and energy would be felt. And that's part of the one of the things that I started to trust because you want to doubt it at first. Am I creating these things on my own? So once I decided to no longer doubt it, he was able to give me more signs and reach through to me more energetically. And through this immediate connection, communication that you had, you also experienced a shared life review? We did. I'm fully aware of some of Dakota's life review and it actually was also doing my life review at the same time. So the current process that we know is the grief process 
are emotions that come up or memories of shared experiences. And when I realized that by not being stuck in the loop, but freeing and sending love his way, I could feel an energetic release happening. And I could see where we both, our souls, were being released from that karmic memory. So right at that moment, you were able to clear any past, future, traumatic triggers of all, right? Am I? Yeah, so it, it, all the life that I had being Dakota's mother for 19 years and all the emotions that come up when he's already transitioned and he's on in the afterlife and he's reviewing those events. Imagine if he's going through his life review and he's reviewing interactions with me. Those are the same events that while I'm here on earth, I'm having memories and feelings around certain memories with Dakota. So by bringing my consciousness into this is a shared experience in timeline that we're both a part of. And by allowing it to be released and freeing him from me reliving it, it's allowing him to allow that freedom in his soul essence because I was feeling it in mine on a soul level. And so I started to allow every moment, micro moment that comes up when you start reliving the emotions of going through a death of someone as an active life review. I started to participate in it as if these are shared events that both souls are experiencing at once, which allowed me to realize this is an active life review I'm having with Dakota and with my higher self when I'm transitioned.